Ladies and gentlemen, uh, your attention please. Uh, before we start the next panel, and I will give the floor over to the next panel chair, uh, let me just um, show this book, uh, which is um, uh, Students on the Cold War. Uh, this is a publication based on the first uh, uh, six conferences um, uh, of our center, and we are planning to produce a uh, second edition, that is, I mean, a, a new volume with students on the Cold War II, right? Uh, like Die Hard 2, 3, 4. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, this is not yet uh, reality. We are working on that. But uh, hopefully, uh, the present presentations, the written presentations um, uh, of this conference, you know, could be, of course, uh, very much uh, coming into this uh, second uh, volume. So because of this, I'm just uh, uh, like uh, passing this over, have a look, just like uh, in the case of the other books which we passed over. So please um, just study uh, it and then uh, please return it by the end. Uh, but then with this, let me just give uh, over the floor to the next panel. So Daniel. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel Vicoy, and I have the honor to present our next panel and the members of our next panel. So our next panel is going to be called Western Asia and the Caucasus in the Cold War. And I have the uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mansur Elijin from Central European University is going to present about uh, the emergence of red Kurds. Uh, this uh, presentation is titled The Emergence of Red Kurds, A Communist Dilemma. Then we're going to uh, listen to the presentation of Af uh, Ahmed Khan Akyuz from Bilkent University. He's an MA student there in Turkey, Ankara. His presentation is called Turkish-American Relations in the Early Years of the Cold War from Economic Cooperation to Military Alliance. And last but definitely not least, we're going to take a look at the presentation of Dina Adanova uh, from the Cold War Archives. She's a Cold War Archives Research Fellow under the Wilson Center at Georgetown University. She's an MA student, and she, her presentation is going to cover the April 89 events in Tbilisi, disparity uh, in dispatch. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to give the floor over personally uh, to Mansur Elijah. Thank you so much. Uh, shall we turn off the lights? We can, of course. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, firstly, yes. thank you so much for having me here. Uh, today, I will be talking, I will be presenting about my research on the emergence of the Red Kurds, the communist dilemma, especially the Kurdish youth and student movement in Europe and their integration and kind of the cooperation with the communist party and movement in Europe in the Ten, first 10 years in uh, of the Cold War, uh, but actually my my research for my MA is kind of a totally different topic. For my MA I work on the standardization of the Kurdish language during the interwar period in Soviet Armenia and French Mandate Syria. So today it's, it will be kind of uh, talking about something that I actually want to study for my future studies. And to begin with my arguments, I believe that the integration of the Kurdish nationalists in the communist struggle gave the Kurdish movement international recognition and support. However, employing communist and pro-Soviet ideology did run against the Kurdish movement itself. This led to unprecedented cooperation with the communist parties in Iraq and Syria, where the Kurds were battling for national recognition. However, this cooperation brought schism as some left the Kurdish caste for communist liberation of the old. Apart from my thesis statement, I think that this study will also help one to answer the following question to a certain degree. What kind of a philosophical and political references and influences did Kurdish intellectual envision for the Kurds as they, as they employed communist ideology? Uh, how did the imagination of a communist Kurdistan unmake the Kurdish nationalist movement in Europe? And finally, how did the Kurdish intellectual and community leaders of the period perceive and deal with the issue of political, cultural, and geographical borders within and across various Kurdish groups in the Middle East, the Caucasus, and the Europe? For the archival wing of my research, I have benefited from different sources. These are primarily personal archives of the period's leading Kurdish names that are available in Kurdish Institute of Paris and Kurdish Library in Vienna. 
Additionally, I, I use some archival documents, mostly field reports produced by Radio Free Europe, which are available here in Budapest. To give the credits, I should state that for my research project, uh, I benefited from a research project conducted uh, by scholars at Sciences Po Lille, which is called the Russian and the Kurds in the Middle East. Uh, as the historical context, uh, the two world wars which spilled blood on the first half of the 20th century witnessed the collapse of some empires and the birth of many new nation states rising from the ashes of these empires. This dramatic shift was accompanied by the situation in which many nation states that could historically protect their territorial continuity were, were deprived of their sovereignty rights and fragmented between different nation states. Even though the curse of the Ottoman Empire were promised by the British and the French the right to establish their independent country by the Treaty of Serf, this was never realized. After the victory of the Turkish Independence War led by Mustafa Kemal in Anatolia, a new agreement was signed in Lausanne, Switzerland in 1923. By this agreement, the Kurds lost the chance to establish an independent Kurdistan. Their historical homeland, Ottoman Kurdistan, was divided between Turkish Republic, French Syria, and British Iraq. Although the Kurds in Turkey, Iraq, and Iran put up many different armed rebellions and resistances for their right to self-determination between the uh, two great wars, they could not make any gains during the interwar period. The Kurdish nationalist movement in Turkey rebelled against the Ankara government in 1920, 19, uh, 1925, 1927, and 1937. According to different sources from the period, during these rebellions, approximately around 50,000 civilian Kurds died and a few thousand of them were forcefully relocated in central Anatolia uh, in, uh, for uh, assimilation policies. Especially after the revolt of 1925, Turkish government did ban the Kurdish language and identity. After the Kurdish defeat in 1937 till the formation of Workers' Party of Turkey in 1960, a dark age for the Kurds started in Turkey. In addition to Turkey, three more political settings deserve special attention for the historical context. These are French Syria, Soviet Caucasus, and Iran. At first place, Soviet Armenia and Azerbaijan are among the places where the Kurds had political and institutional, and institutional means and opportunities. To illustrate, between 1923 uh, and 1930, there was a political entity called Kurdistan in Azerbaijan SSR. Additionally, in Soviet Armenia, a small community of Yazidi Kurds enjoyed a relatively prospective period in which Kurdish culture, language, and identity flourished. The first Kurdish newspaper in Latin letters was published in Armenia during this period. In Iran, also, the Kurdish rebellions failed to gain national rights in the early 20th century. However, in 1946, thanks to the support of the Soviet Union, the Kurds succeeded to establish the Republic of Kurdistan. The self-governing and unrecognized Soviet satellite state did collapse at the same year after Soviet Union decided to pull out, out of the northeastern era. Though all of the authori authorities of this republic were executed, Commander-in-Chef Mustafa of Barzan, whose picture we saw at the very beginning of this pr presentation, he managed to escape to Soviet Union. He lived there for 10 years till the military coup of uh, 1956 in Iraq. It was then when he went to Iraq to start a series of Kurdish rebellions with the support of Soviet Union. On the other hand, after the 1925 defeat in Turkey, a great number of the Kurds, some of whom were very prominent intellectuals, fled to Syrian Kurdistan, which was part and parcel of French mandate. This was another location where the Kurds had some certain rights, such as publishing in their own language. The Kurdish intellectual circle in Greater Syria founded the organization named Hoybun in 1927, this nationalist association was the power behind the 1930 rebellion in Turkey. This rebellion was on borderland with Soviet 
and it was supported by Armenian Revolutionary Federation. 1930 was also the year in which the Kurdistan district in Soviet Azerbaijan was dissolved. What is remarkable about the Kurdish intellectual circle in French Syria is that they started to show interest in Soviet policy and communist ideology. In the publication of those intellectuals, one can easily see how they perceive the Soviet Union as a power that could assist them in pursuing independence. It is important to note that the first generation of those names were indeed not ideologically communist. They just thought victorious Soviet will help them with their struggle. Overall, thanks to the defeat in Turkey, Iran, and, and the end of the French rule in Syria, things again dramatically changed for the Kurds. It also caused the Kurdish political struggle to end in the public sphere. What remained were Kurdish organizations that were involved in politics within the communist parties in the mentioned countries. However, immediately after the end of the World War II, a number of Kurdish students, who I call the second generation of the intellectual circle in Syria, had the chance to move Francophone European city such as Paris and Lausanne. I would like to specifically mention two of them, uh, Nureddin Zaza and Ismet Sherif Banlı. Zaza was born into a politically active Kurdish family in Ottoman Empire in 1990. Right after the Kurdish resistance in 1927, his father and <coughs> elder brother were arrested on the ground they were involved in the rebellion. A few, of, a few years after it, when he was only 11 years old, he and his older brother went to Syria. He quickly became politicized by the meeting with Kurdish leaders and intellectuals there. He studied at the French high school in Damascus. Zaza received his bachelor in political science from the French University in Beirut in 1947. And in the same year, he went to Italy by ship from Beirut to transfer to Lausanne for higher education. Additionally, Ismet Sherif Banlı was born in Damascus to Kurdish parents from northern Kurdistan, Turkey. His father, who had no ties to the Kurdish national cause, was an Ottoman official. However, his son kind of rediscovered his Kurdish identity as he met Kurdish political circles and became more political as he listened to the memories of the Kurdish rebellions and the massacres in uh, Turkey. As a matter of fact, his father, who was observing this situation, expressed his displeasure due to his son's involvement in politics while sending him off to Lausanne. With a semi-arrogant tone, he said, Go, Ismet. Don't come back before you become a diplomat and be appointed as Kurdistan ambassador to Uganda. I don't know why Uganda. <laughs> it was not a coincidence at all that the two went to the Lausanne to study their master's studies. In this city, in 1923, the agreement which recognizes the Turkish Republic and the division of Kurdistan was signed. Moreover, Lausanne was the home to the European branch of the first Kurdish student organization that was founded in 1912. Under the leadership of these two names in 1949, the Association of the Kurdish Students in Europe was founded in Lausanne. According to the memories of Nureddin Zaza, the association has four primary goals, which are being member of international youth and student organization, participating in the Second World Festival of Youth and Students in Budapest, to set connections with student organization in Kurdistan and the rest of the Middle East, and publishing a media outlet. It can be argued that the association initially achieved all of its aims. The members published a journal named Denge Kurdistan, the voice of Kurdistan, in Kurdish, English, and French. The articles and the news in the student journal revealed that this association was predominantly pro-Soviet and communism. To illustrate, I would like to directly quote from the journal. The Kurdish people do not accept the Anglo-American military missions to establish bases of aggression against the Soviet Union in Turkey, which is the stronghold of peace and socialism. The Kurdish people are unquestionably committed to the democratic peace and freedom camp, which will save the world from war, banditry, and oppression. As we can see, they believe that Soviet Union was the power that could save the oppressed people, and they try to include the Kurdish uh, people into the greater international socialist community. 
The association also achieved its goal to participate the second World Festival of Youth and Students in Budapest. The motto of the outlet for this Soviet propaganda was national independence and a better future for the people, while the slogan of the Kurdish delegate was long live Mustafa of Barzan and the Stalin. The participation of the Kurdish delegate in the festival was also published in the journal. I will again directly quote from the journal's news concerning the participation. As our delegate spoke of the national rights, as our delegate spoke of the national rights enjoyed by the Kurds in the Soviet Union, the economic, cultural and social progress they made there, the heroic achievement in the Soviet Army, the entire whole stood, stood up twice to apply the development opportunity that socialism has provided to the nations, and <coughs> Kurdish youth will intensify their anti-fascist and anti-imperial struggle uh, and will always be at the forefront of the Middle East struggle for peace and liberation. We will remain faithful to the old struggle for the peace and <coughs> happiness of the people, which we took in August 28 at H Hero Square in Budapest. Although it's not mentioned in the news published by this journal, from the personal memories of Nureddin Zaza, we know that actually the Kurdish delegate was not welcomed in Budapest. The Communist Party and the delegates from Syria, Iraq, and Iran did not want to be together with the Kurdish delegate, as the Kurdish students did want to speak on behalf of Kurdistan, not only the Kurdish people. This is why, this is why Nureddin Zaza and his friend were accused of being saboteurs and agents by some. At the end, the Kurdish delegates managed to participate thanks to the leftist party from this South America. Namely, this was the first occasion where the Kurdish youth was criticized by the communists for deploying a nationalist agenda. Unfortunately, this criticism brought schism to the Kurdish Student Association. After the return from the festival in Budapest, the association was dissolved by its founder on the basis of internal ideological conflicts. Some members of the movement believed that the existence of the association contradicted the unity of the working class and should be dissolved. Even one of the members, Abdurrahman Qasimlu, who was at the same time a member of the Iranian communist movement, argued that talking about the Kurdistan and the Kurdish nation and its right was nothing about Kurdish chauvinism and was therefore against the internationalism of the Communist Party, namely what mattered was the communist liberation of all, not the only of the Kurdish people. After the dissolution of the association, the Kurdish youth was integrated more and more into the Communist Party, especially in early 50s as communist movement from Turkey, Iran and Syria organized and organized in East Germany and started the radio broadcast. Some Kurdish students also broadcasted under the umbrella of these parties' movements in Kurdish language on the sake of the international struggles. Same in this uh, 1956, this time Zaza and Ismet Sherif Banlı initiated the foundation of another student organization, but at the funding congress of this new society in the summer of 1956, almost the same conflict occurred within the, communi within the communi community as in the 1949. Kurdish students who were members of Iraqi, Iranian and Syrian Communist Party insisted on the idea of an association that will focus solely on the association, uh, solely on culture and student affairs rather than political activity to support the Kurdish national cause. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Cemci, who was a member of Syria Communist Party, was elected as the association president. Having failed in the second attempt, Nureddin Zazar returned to Syria French to fund the Kurdistan uh, Democratic Party in Syria. I think I should finish because of the timing. If you don't mind, could you wrap it up, please? Yeah, as the concluding remarks, I can argue that as Kurdish movement in, in its homeland lost space and means to struggle, Europe, thanks to the Kurdish student, emerged and as, as a, another social political space where the Kurds could struggle for their national rights. Although early on the Kurdish youth was hopeful and optimistic about the communist ideology and the Soviet support, on the contrary, this uh, communist ideology and integration with the communist movement brought division within the Kurdish movement itself, as some of the Kurdish uh, uh, student left the nationalist agenda for the sake of internationalism. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. If you don't mind, we're not going to leave quest, uh, time for questions at the moment. We're going to move on with the other presentations and we're going to have a Q&A session at the very end. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for this very interesting presentation for Mansur and I would like to give the floor over to uh, Kaan, please. Yeah. I was just told, unfortunately, but we need to, uh, you could fit into 15 minutes, that would be awesome. Yeah, of course. Thank, you so, thank you so much. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for this great opportunity. Uh, I'm from Turkey and I'm an MA student uh, in history department at Birkent University. Uh, my research interests are mainly Turkish American relations, uh, but more specifically, currently I am studying the cultural reflections of uh, their diplomatic relations during the Cold War period. Uh, but today uh, I will not talk about the cultural history, but the diplomatic history of uh, Turkish American relations in the early years of the Cold War. Uh, the period that I will explain starts from the 1946 to the 1960s, but mainly it will be about the 50s, uh, which most people and scholars consider this decade uh, as a golden age of Turkish-American relations, of course. Uh, firstly, I want to provide a general overview. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, it's fine. Right. Yeah. Uh, on April 5, 1946, uh, a famous American battleship, USS Missouri, uh, arrived in Turkey to bring the corpse of one of the most critical Turkish diplomats, Münir Ertegün, as you can see. Uh, he was the ambassador to Washington, D.C. at the time. Mm -hmm. This gesture uh, from the U.S. Uh, to Turkey was welcomed by both the Turkish government and the public. On the same day, one of the most prominent uh, newspapers, Cumhuriyet, which means Republic, uh, gave a headline saying, welcoming the sailors of friendly America. Uh, and only five days after the arrival of the USS Missouri, another journalist uh, of the Republic, Abidin Daver, demonstrated this gesture as a manifestation of Turkish-American friendship. Uh, they were also both journalists and politicians. Uh, while Nadi was a member of parliament from the Democrat Party, uh, Daver served uh, as an MP during the single party period. So, uh, as they revealed, starting from April 1946, uh, Turkey and the United States began to have much closer relations on the eve of the Cold War. Uh, particularly during the 1950s, Democrat Party government uh, in Turkey has implemented highly pro-American attitudes. Even Jalal Bayar, the president of Turkey, you can see that, uh, wishfully called Turkey a tiny America. So uh, from sending troops to Korea to becoming a member of NATO, Turkish decision makers uh, led by Bayar and Menderes sought closer ties to the West, especially to the United States, with the country's economic growth and military power. Uh, yes. Uh, First, I want to explain Turkish perspective, Turkish mindset uh, for this cooperation. Uh, the transformation of the Turkish attitude towards the United States dates back to 1945, when the Second World War was over. Uh, the national security concerns of Turkish decision makers continued to shape the foreign policy strategies of Turkey. And uh, in 1945, the Turkish-Soviet crisis may be considered the most decisive factor from the Turkish perspective in the early years of the Cold War. Uh, for Turkey, the Soviets had an aggressive attitude towards them, more specific on the Turkish Straits. Uh, during the meeting between the Russian Foreign Minister Molotov and uh, Selim Sarper, he was the ambassador to the Soviet Union, it was advocated that Stalin had intended to take control over the Turkish Straits. So concerning this meeting, uh, there are two different explanations in the literature. Uh, some scholars uh, claim that the Turkish government, led by Ismet İnönü, created a myth uh, to ally with the West. Uh, in other words, there were no official demands, uh, territorial demands from the Soviet Union regarding the Turkish Strait. Uh, but however, in other uh, respect, uh, in return for the renewal of the expired 1925 friendship treaty between Turkey and the Soviet Union, uh, Molotov demanded a free passage of Soviet warships through the Straits, uh, their closure to non-Black Sea states, the third, the establishment of Soviet bases at the Straits, and finally, the retrocession to Russia of the eastern provinces of Kars and Ardahan, which had been returned to Turkey in 1921. So this crisis was a turning point in relations between the US and Turkey. 
cooperation with the Western Bloc, especially with the United States, uh, became necessary for Turkey to prevent Soviet threats. Uh, because the state's territorial integrity was at stake, uh, Turkey had to be a part of an alliance that could be able to provide security and economic assistance. So, the U.S. perspective, uh, the situation was more complicated at first. Uh, Harry Truman and his advisors seemed ignorant of Soviet concerns and worried about Russian intentions in the Middle East, uh, especially Iran, Turkey, and Greece. Uh, none of these countries could American leaders conceive of a threat to Soviet security, of any justifiable reason for Soviet behavior, even at the war's end, uh, and even after Moscow began to press Turkey for minor territorial adjustments uh, and share in the control of the Dardanelles, Truman was initially sympathetic to a Soviet role in the administration of the state. But uh, eventually he reversed course as uh, this agreeable Soviet behavior elsewhere raised doubts in his mind about Soviet intentions. No American leader accepted the idea of a significant role in the Middle East. Uh, that was reason for the Soviet Union. Uh, the region was considered a British sphere, uh, and George Kennan found his government depressingly slow to understand Soviet objectives and needed to be firm in resisting Stalin. Uh, Kennan had been eager to contain the Soviets uh, everywhere in Europe, but it was the Dean Acheson. Uh, yeah, Dean Acheson was the one who had been particularly troubled by Soviet pressures on Turkey. He knew that Turkey and Iran would follow if Greece fell into their hands. Uh, a crisis in Greece, in which the British uh, had lost the will and lacked the resource to manage, provided the opportunity to apply and explain what came to be known as the containment policy, as you all know. So uh, in February 1947, uh, when Britain officially informed the US that they could no longer support the Greek government, Marshall's team was ready, as was Truman. Congressional leaders were called to the White House, where Marshall uh, explained the situation in Turkey, described the inability of the British to play their historical role in the region and asked for an appropriation of funds necessary for the US to take over. $400 million of economic aid was provided for Greece and Turkey, but initially only 12% of the total assistance was allocated to Turkey. Despite this, the doctrine of Truman was welcomed by the public. Headings of two leading newspapers, again, the Cumhuriyet, uh, the Republic, and Gece Postası reflect the excitement of Turkish people and more important the mention that Turkey chose to integrate into the Western Bloc on the US side. So, yeah, uh, after the economic cooperation between the US and Turkey, the early Cold War dynamics rapidly continued to shape their relations. Soviet aggression was still on the agenda. Uh, it was the top priority among Western powers and economic development was not enough for Turkish decision makers. So military intimidation from anti-communist bloc for Joseph Stalin was needed, according to Turkey. Uh, on 25 June uh, 1950, the war emerged in Korea. So to demonstrate their commitment to the Western camp, the Democrat Party government, led by Adnan Menderes, uh, announced the dispatch of a Turkish brigade of 5,090 men to join the UN forces. Uh, this action, by the way, was one of the most uh, highly disputed issues uh, in the Democrat Party period in Turkey, because there was a common view that uh, this war should not be the case, of, case for the Turkish military. Uh, but on the other hand, sending troops to the Korean War has provided a way to join NATO. In other words, uh, Menderes and Bayar uh, took the advantage of the situation to achieve its purposes. And by the way, uh, this purpose was also the main aim of the Indian government before the Democrat Party. So therefore, Turkey has initially sent uh, 4,500 military personnel to Korea. And this was the second largest number among 15 states. For this reason, uh, Turkey was still arguing that uh, the commitment to the West had been proven and Turkey deserved to be a member of NATO. However, the problematic aspect of this process was not only related to the United States. Great Britain was literally against uh, Turkish membership because they actually had a different plan uh, regarding Turkey and it was a military uh, cooperation in the Middle East. However, uh, despite Britain's efforts, uh, Turkey's only wish was a total military alliance, so their proposals were rejected by Turkey. So this reject uh, rejection accelerated the membership process of Turkey. And in May 1951, President Harry Truman decided to press for the admission of Turkey as a full member of NATO. So from the US perspective, Turkey's effort to join NATO and demonstrate its loyalty to Korea were not the only reasons, of course, for this admission. The military capacity of the Soviets uh, increased in the 
early years of the Cold War. Uh, and in the National Security Council, the United States reported that the Soviet Union would have the ability to use nuclear weapons against the U.S. and its allies. Therefore, Turkey should have also been a U.S. military base uh, because of its location. Uh, also, the geopolitical position of Turkey was also a threat to the other member states of NATO. If Turkey was influenced or invaded by the Soviet Union, uh, the security of the whole European continent could also be at risk. In other words, for the interest of both sides, uh, a total alliance was kind of inevitable. Uh, as a result, nine months later, uh, in 1952, Turkey became a member of NATO. Through the admission of Turkey, we can say that uh, the economic cooperation <coughs> Uh, eventually converted to a military alliance. So, uh, at the end of the process, uh, when Turkey became an active player uh, on a Western bloc against the Soviet Union, it can be claimed that Turkey also lost uh, its proactive neutrality during the Second World War, which led Turkey to emerge as a non-belligerent state and prevent devastation. Uh, but in 1952, Turkey could not implement its old foreign policy strategies and had to take a role in the international arena and to the side, and Turkey uh, located itself on the U.S. side. As William Hale uh, believed that uh, after six years, post-war Turkish foreign policy had fi finally realized its paramount objective. Uh, in retrospect, the transition process to full membership of the Western alliance could be seen as Turkey's most important foreign policy change since the 1920s. So that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being able to keep the time and for this very interesting insight into uh, Turkish foreign policy uh, in the first stages of the Cold War. And let's now turn our attention to Dina Danova, please. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the Wilson Center for this wonderful fellowship opportunity, uh, Victoria, Chuck, and Christian, uh, the Open Society Archives for a warm welcome during the last week, um, and of course, Carvinos University for hosting us here today. Uh, so the title of my project is April uh, 89 Events in Tbilisi, Disparity in Dispatch, and today I will talk uh, about the media coverage of protests that happened in Tbilisi, Soviet Georgia, uh, on the eve of collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, during my presentation, I will first talk about my research design, uh, briefly discuss the methodology, outline historical background precipitating the events, uh, and focus on uh, the media coverage uh, of the protests themselves. Uh, to give a brief context, uh, uh, what happened back then, almost 9,000, uh, according to uh, local Georgian sources, uh, 15,000 people went to streets and protested uh, in front of the government building at Rusta Valley Avenue uh, during the night of April 8th. Uh, Soviet troops uh, were introduced in tanks uh, and the Soviet army used tear gas, uh, gas against the protesters and as a result, 19 people died uh, and hundreds got injured. Um, so following the pace of reforms um, and a sequence of political unrest uh, that emerged in the Soviet Union during the era of perestroika, uh, why should we care about Belisi? Uh, uh, what makes it an interesting case study? And I would like to uh, quote uh, Yegor Lygachev, who, is the head of the, who was the head of the Central Committee Secretariat of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. He stated once that none had political reverberations equal to those of the Tbilisi affair, and no other incident was investigated by so many commissions. So despite the abundance of data about Tbilisi events in comparison, for instance, to uh, Almaty protests that happened three years earlier, um, and all the information was just destroyed, Tbilisi affair in Georgia uh, still represents a puzzle. Um, so the task of this project is not really to find who to blame for those events, uh, but it, it's an attempt to lift the veil behind the political paradigm of the Belize CFA by studying media materials that could suggest major structural challenges that the system was facing uh, back then. Uh, so the question uh, I'm trying to answer is uh, what, what does the April 9 incident in Belize in 1989, its coverage in central, local, and foreign media, members of the Politburo members, tell us about the lines of communication between the center and the periphery amid the late uh, era of perestroika. 
And uh, the central claim, I argue, is that the Tbilisi so-called Tbilisi affair reveals the political decay of the Communist Party, the lack of communication between the core Moscow and the periphery of Tbilisi, and more importantly, uh, the vacuum of power that parallels information vacuum in reported newspapers. Uh, so for this research, um, I followed a qualitative case study analysis, drawing evidence from digital archives as foreign broadcast information service, the Wilson Center uh, archives, national security archives, uh, the East View database, uh, but also the uh, Open Society archives that we had an opportunity to work at um, uh, during the last week. Uh, so the, the media sources include some central uh, Soviet newspapers, local Georgian newspaper, Western media sources, but also published oral histories uh, and memories of Politburo members, such as Anatoly Strunov's diary, Gorbachev's, Lugachev's, Shevardnadze, and of course, uh, Gorbachev's uh, memories about the uh, end of the Soviet Union. Um, so to give a brief context about what Soviet Georgia was uh, during that time, uh, it was actually one of the most prosper, prosperous titular republics. It has, it had warm climate uh, and still has uh, fertile lands, beautiful landscape. Uh, it was a popular vacation destination for many Soviet elites. And we can think that definitely Georgia had higher standards of living in comparison to other republics. And one might uh, assume that this prosperity might have increased confidence uh, that Georgia can thrive with, without Moscow. Uh, but that would be, however, misleading because Georgia's case is much more nuanced and complex and that it relates mostly to the multi-ethnic rivalry within the republic itself. Um, the, the period of perestroika showed the major essence of the Soviet society, its plasticity um, and absolute conformist nature. Over 70 years of communist experiment, the totalitarian practices of the state completely transformed the people into a flexible material that intuitively adapted to new conditions. Um, and uh, as Archie Brown argues, it was not so much a case of crisis forcing radical reform as of radical reform generating crisis. Uh, so following this period of democratization introduced by Gorbachev's reforms, Abkhaz Autonomous uh, Socialist Soviet uh, Republic tried to demand the status of the Soviet Socialist Republic. So they wanted mainly to attain the status of a titular nation equal to Tbilisi and thus aspire to uh, alienate from, uh, from the center. Uh, so Georgian nationalists, um, in, in, particular, uh, in particular, the so that was the Lukhny Declaration uh, that was um, established in March 1989. That was the trigger to the April events in Tbilisi. So uh, major German, uh, Georgian nationalists, Mirab Kostava and Ziad Gamsakurdia, they orchestrated protests in Abkhazia and then in Tbilisi with slogans down with Russian imperialism. On March 20 and 23, the local Georgian newspaper Zedavostoka reports the mass demonstrations of protests against Abkhazian separatism held by Georgians in Suhumi, Tbilisi, and Kutaisi. Uh, on April 7th, the head of the Georgian uh, Socialist Soviet Republic back then, Jumbur Petyashvili, sent a telegram to the Central Committee of the Communist Party to report on the events. And he stated, the situation in the Republic has recently worsened and is practically getting out of control. Uh, Moscow seemed unaware of the urgency and complexity of the situation in Georgia. Either the Central Committee was preoccupied with routine affairs or in the center and didn't pay attention to the developments in the republics or intentionally disregarded this dispatch. Igor Ligachev, the head of uh, the Central Committee Secretariat of the Communist Party, uh, was known in the Politburo circle as conservative and, um, and antagonist of the Stroika itself. Uh, and he stated that, I recall that in the course of the conversation with Vadim Medvedev, who was the chief ideology in the Soviet Union back then, um, he stated that a coded telegram has come in, uh, in from Tbilisi, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. So uh, we can wonder how long it might take Soviet officials to recode a telegram. Uh, does Likachev simply spin in tricks uh, in Moscow? Um, he later stated as well that there is no question that if on the morning of 8th April, Shevardnadze had gone to Tbilisi, as Gorbachev suggested, the tragic night of April 9 would uh, have never happened. Uh, following this rhetoric that Ligachev provides, uh, Shevardnadze seems to disobey the first general secretary for the t first time in history and didn't depart to Georgia immediately as it was requested. So uh, for me, it seems uh, rather doubtful uh, to, to make this clear argument to blame Shevardnadze. 
there is a lot of understatement uh, about what has was happening during the evening of April 8 itself. Uh, for instance, Patiashvili reported to Moscow the following morning that the situation at a demonstration um, uh, of about 15,000 people at the Republic government house and also in other parts of the city began to be inflamed by extremists and got out of control. So here we see that the number of participants raised uh, to 15,000. Um, and Gorbachev himself in his uh, memoirs later uh, stated that, but who gave the order to use force? This remains a mystery which neither the Congress of People's Deputies nor numerous commissions investigating events in Tbilisi have been able to solve. I believe that the local military command in Georgia, entirely unsuspecting, was the victim of political intrigues. Uh, the, also, there is a lot of obscurity uh, on the use of weapons, uh, and by, uh, why would Petyashvili, in this already ruined situation, conceal facts from Moscow? The local officials already knew by the time that people died as a result of crush, however, the debate in media uh, persisted. Um, so here I would like to just introduce some narratives um, generated by some of the central newspapers, but also uh, the Washington Post and Western media. Um, so for instance, the Moscow's daily newspaper uh, named Izvestia allotted only one small paragraph at the age of the very last page, uh, the day following the events. It portrayed the events in a very shallow way uh, with a strong focus on uh, the fact that the factories had stopped working um, and there was no explanation to the nature of the events or why they happened at all. Uh, the foreign media agencies seem to have more information about what was happening um, locally uh, than the central Soviet newspapers. Uh, at the same time, with distorted and censored central media coverage, the diversity of opinions and lack of accurate information led to contested uh, data on the number of uh, people who died uh, at the square. And as a result of this information vacuum, several theories, uh, speculations, and rumors emerged. Um, interestingly enough, the, uh, one of the major newspapers, Argumenti um, Facti, when, when, when the Union was on this brink of collapse, uh, it only decided to debate what the Western side was arguing. Uh, so they tried to defend its image um, and simply reply to, to the accusations of, of those made by the Washington Post and precisely David Tramnik, who was reporting um, uh, during that time. Uh, so these are some of the uh, newspapers that we had a chance to look uh, during the last week. Uh, it was interesting to have this uh, communication between some local journalists making their own arguments, but also Igor Rodionov, who was then the head of the Transcaucasian military um, and defending his position that he is not to blame. Uh, another interesting fact is that the memories of state officials show the significance of Georgia. Um, and I would like to quote, uh, Chernev, uh, Georgia is a sign of destiny. If a Christian nation loved by the Russians with whom we have lived in perfect harmony for more than 200 years, fought together and truly respected each other, wants to leave the USSR, does that mean something? There is no longer the Baltics where everything is clear. Um, here, Gorbachev sometimes says unexpected things, for example, about the Georgian authorities who put in their pants and set troops to the people. They cannot think in a different way, and different way meaning the perestroika and democratization and policy of new thinking. Uh, so there is a huge circle of blame um, here on the left side, Igor Dionov, then Shevardnadze, and Anatoly Sobchak, who was the head of the commission that was investigating uh, the police affair. Uh, we, we, we can hear some different other surnames, uh, like Patiashvili, uh, uh, who the local media is extensively blaming for those events. So there is no real uh, vision who, who was to blame. But as I said, it's not really the focus of my uh, research. Um, it rather unveils the uh, dismantlement of the Soviet system, the political intrigues that the uh, uh, communist uh, party apparatus had uh, during uh, the, the era of perestroika, and the, we can think that the structural decay actually led to the uh, union's collapse. So the bloody spring mm -hmm. at Belisi in 1989 elucidates the structural disintegration of the communist party and lack of communication between the <coughs> core Moscow and the periphery of Belisi. Uh, it also suggests that the longevity of the system was tied to the uh, longevity of the Communist Party itself. 
so that from, from being a very totalitarian state, uh, very bureaucratic, it ended up to just a mass of uh, political intrigues and um, uh, accusations within the party itself. Uh, we also can think that the information vacuum uh, that was uh, in, uh, persistent in the media suggests that the nationalist narrative, what was uh, an anti-Abhas movement, it turned into an anti-Abhas struggle. So the media, for instance, that was from June and December, later during that year, only, <coughs> only focuses on this anti-Soviet struggle and everyone forgot, forgot, has forgotten about the, um, the inter-ethnic rivalry within Georgia itself. Uh, so the vacuum of power uh, created this opportunity uh, for, for, for political intrigues and the ambiguities of 1989 served as a platform for new elites to break down the union. And Thank you very much for your attention. Um, we are looking forward to it. Thank you so much for this fascinating insight on the last days of uh, Soviet Union as far as Georgia is concerned. And now we uh, can open up the, uh, the whole session for questions and answers. So I think we already have one from uh, from uh, Varnabash, but also there were some other uh, questions. So I think we should uh, record uh, three, four, five questions, and then uh, I will give the floor over to uh, the presenters again. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you for the lovely presentation. Short question to each of you. Uh, to Mansour, uh, you mentioned radio uh, broadcast in Kurdish from East Germany, correct? Yes. Yes. Well, the question is, who was the target audience of this radio? Question to Ahmed. Uh, can you specifically mention the Kars and Ardahan and the original problem and the claim by the Soviet Union? Can you specify uh, uh, uh, this issue regarding the topic you were talking about? What was its role in this case, in this dispute? And question to Dina. Uh, can you specify the the role of the Western media regarding the, the events. What I mean here is the, it seems that the local media was quite well prepared for it, well, uh, was ready to report on the issues. But my question is, was the Western media present, surely it was, you, you, you presented uh, motion to post and stuff like that. So how well prepared were they for the events? Thank you. Thank you so much. There were some other questions in the back. Yes, please. Um, I have like uh, three questions for Dina, but like uh, my first question was just uh, uh, asked, so it's perfect. Um, oh, thank you, by the way, for the panel. And uh, but I'm sorry, guys, I'm just doing like a little bit. Uh, my fellow colleague from uh, uh, Sea War. Um, so you you mentioned that at some point it was uh, Gorbachev was like kind of flabbergasted, you can say, about this. And interestingly enough, like there is there was a documentary with the I remember like Bernard Herzog uh, meeting Gorbachev, and at some point he uh, he asked like the question to Gorbachev, and it seems like you know you have like what he said, but you have also like his like body uh, language, and he was like pretty upset about this. So, um, so I would like like to know exactly what you think his feeling, like his full feeling was, because you gave us like a, an excellent quote. And the other one is like uh, you mentioned like the kind of like asymmetrical slash disconnection between. Moscow and Tbilisi, and especially like the regime in Tbilisi and, and the regime in, in Moscow. Um, can we say? Can we see like a sort of like? I'm going to try to phrase it even better, like if I can. Uh, can we see like a sort of uh, at that period of time in '89 uh, a sort of like completely disconnection because we were like probably at the end and Russia was not like that popular in the head of like some uh, local leader um, and. My, the comparison that I had like immediately when you were talking about this without like pushing the Tbilisi comparison a little too far was with Berlin in 1961 because some people said like, oh, you know, like the uh, Soviets are coming, they are building the war and everything, but they thought that like East Germany was like more, uh, has like a stronger appetite. So in that case, can we see like a sort of like, you know, inverse like role of seeing like we are like almost at the end of like the, the, the Soviet Union and like those local are uh, playing like really a part for like um, uh, policy in order to like maintain themselves like in power 
and with Moscow, it looks not like buying that. Like, I'm sorry for the long question. I Thank you. Thank you. And there was one more question over there. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have um, <coughs> for Mansur. So I'd like to ask a long durée question because you um, spoke about a period when the Kurdish movement was very much influenced by Marxism and the communist movement. So what do you think? How did the movement evolve from that time you study until the present day? Because I'm not a big expert, but I'm seeing that if you see, if you look at Ojalans later, uh, I think it seems very much influenced by Butchkin, so that he has reached a sort of democratic confederalism. I don't know how much this has to do with this, the previous uh, communist or Marxist uh, background. So I'm curious uh, about the long red opinion on this. Thank you so much, and uh, I would like to give the floor over to Dr. Bekish as well. Uh, just one short comment again, and uh, this is about uh, Turkey. Uh, you mentioned um, the Turkish position in the Second World War as a proactive neutrality, which is absolutely true for that uh, uh, most part of the uh, Second World War. But it is very often uh, forgotten that actually Turkey did enter the war in February 1945. And it's uh, overlooked in, in many ways. And that's how Turkey actually was uh, becoming a, an allied power. And uh, uh, yeah. that was not a big, uh, uh, not, not a small thing to achieve because they would, they were actually uh, neutral throughout the, the war. But in the very end, they were under pressure to join, but they didn't. Uh, but in February, they actually uh, gave in, and by this, they actually bought the membership in the United Nations. Uh, so. This is just a fact, you know, it's nothing to uh, comment on, but, but this belongs to the story. So this always has, has to be added, I, I think. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. In that case, do we have any further questions? If not, I would like to give the uh, floor back to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. To start with the targeted audience, I think the issue of targeted audience of this radio broadcast is a bit problematic. It is because uh, this radio were mostly kind of the uh, student radio and they were not you know, broadcasting widely. And even for the Kurdish part, uh, Kurdish students in Europe, they didn't have their own radio. Uh, they kind of the broadcasted under the umbrella of the Communist Party of Iraq, Iran, and Syria. In that case, uh, thinking that we don't have the records and the archives of this radio broadcasting, we only know that at some times in okay. East Germany, there were some Kurdish radio broadcasting. Okay. That's it. But for the same time in Soviet Armenia, the Armenian uh, Communist Party established a, a radio broadcasting in Kurdish, and that one is much more important uh, for the general Kurdish history culture wise. Uh, for your question concerning the long durée, uh, the reason why I kind of has to pen the Temporarily in a broader way is because I think that to understand, uh, you know, the kind of the uh, uh, uh, evolution of the Kurdish struggle and the movement, uh, we should kind of uh, uh, focus on these uh, transitional periods. If you want to understand the uh, students in Europe, we should first look at the French Syria and other localities. And to understand the French Syria, we should look at the late Ottoman uh, Kurdish nationalism as uh, the Kurdish population in Syria uh, kind of had fled from the uh, Turkish government after the uh, after the declaration of the Turkish Republic. Uh, there was kind of the these integration and the kind of the entanglement through the history of the Kurdish politics. And uh, concerning the Abdullah Öcalan and his ideology, um, unfortunately, it's kind of a very complicated issue for me. That's why I will not be able to kind of. Uh, provide a satisfying answer to your question. Thank you so much. Can I okay. Uh, so if it's okay, by the way, regarding the Second World War uh, neutrality, uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, there were uh, really big pressure from both sides, uh, both Great Britain and from the Nazi Germany. Uh, maybe you know the famous picture, uh, FDR, Churchill, and uh, Ismet Inönü. So, but uh, despite this pressure, uh, and because Turkey had economic relations with the Nazi Germany, despite all this, uh, Turkey remained neutral. So it's a big thing. I agree with you, definitely. And uh, about your question, actually, uh, it's still unclear 
for example, uh, I can recommend an article uh, of Behlül Özkan. Uh, he's a scholar in Turkey, and he said that uh, he uh, emphasized that um, actually there were no any threats, no uh, any threats to cars, are down or straights. But uh, th this is a myth. But on the other side, for example, uh, my professor uh, at Bilkent, Onur Ishi, uh, also is a specialist uh, in Turkish Russian relations. He said that it's, it does not admit. So I don't know the exact story. Uh, so I don't know the answer, in other words. But uh, I can say that uh, from my uh, perspective, from uh, what I found, uh, there were no official demands, uh, but uh, during the meeting between Selim Sarper and Molotov, uh, Molotov said that we we want them, but no official demand. Okay, but it doesn't mean that uh, they didn't demand anything. So this is my uh, view. Personally, they didn't want to leave the area. It took them quite a long time to leave the area. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, uh, it's a very interesting, um, indeed. Like to, I, I think I haven't mentioned the role of Western media, but um, I, how well were they prepared? I, I think nobody expected that to really happen uh, that rapidly. Uh, but definitely, like the sources that I was going through, Washington Post, uh, Paris uh, AFP, and Hamburg DPA, I think they were covering uh, the events pretty well. Uh, so they were definitely. Uh, having a local journalist uh, in Georgia, uh, but also the uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, shows a great number of dispatches that were happening back then because human rights issue was uh, at the focus for them. Uh, and I think also uh, we can assume that as well, Washington Post was rather more interested in the number of deaths rather than inter uh, ethnic rivalry and political situations. So they were trying to portray. Uh, the atrocities of the Soviet uh, army and uh, troops uh, in Belize. Uh, but they did a, gr a great job in, in a way that they provided information for the people because uh, the Soviet uh, central and even local newspapers, they were censored. Uh, for instance, the uh, youth newspaper Molodos Gruzi, they couldn't even um, release their daily newspapers, so it was definitely um, n not possible for them. Uh, so we see that even glassness, this openness, uh, it was, it was, it was not present. Uh, uh, the the media was distorted. Um, and uh, to the question, uh, Max, that you ask, I think Gorbachev himself uh, was very genuine uh, in bringing this democratic reforms. Um, I feel that he was a, a victim of this uh, political rivalry because there were a lot of conservatives uh, in the Communist Party itself and they felt that he was weak at the same time Gorbachev was not in Moscow when it happened. Um, it's a, a such a coincidence that when every major event happened, uh, he, he was not in office uh, for some reason. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to clarify the last question that you asked. Do you? You said that uh, at the end of the Soviet Union, do you mean uh, the end of periphery or end of, in terms of timing? Uh, more end of timing. Timing, end okay, end. yeah. See, like a sort of like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, many people in the Soviet Union themselves, they didn't believe that, uh, they were not yeah. expecting the Soviet Union to collapse. So, for instance, people I interviewed in Kazakhstan for my different project on Kurganda, they were saying that um, they they were rather reluctant to reveal the, for instance, atrocities that were done in the Gulag camp uh, Karlag because they were afraid that a different system would come, like a new leader, and uh, they were they would be censored as well. Uh, so I think for uh, for Georgians it was a, as a bit different of a case because it was not really an anti-Soviet movement um, initially; it was anti abhaz movement uh, that just transformed into anti-Soviet because, like the Soviet army itself. Uh, engendered this crisis. They they killed the people. Uh, they they shot the protesters, and of course it would um, it enlarge the sentiment. Because as I told, the Georgia uh, Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic was rather prosperous. They they were benefiting a lot within the Soviet Union. Uh, so they didn't really had an incentive uh, to diverge. Uh, and yeah, uh, I think it was uh, it was a very interesting. Um, 
dynamic to observe between Moscow and Belisi. Um, and what you, you were asking about asymmetrical, um, what was that about? Like, oh, yeah, it was like asymmetrical creation because you, you can see like sometimes in the Soviet Union, it's not like completely uniform and uniform flow. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there is some states, that, I mean some states, some satellites, sorry. Some satellites were going to ask like more from Moscow, yeah. less from Moscow, Moscow is going to ask more. And I made like this comparison, and I'm sorry if it's a brutal like comparison because 61 and then 89 were different, very mm -hmm. different leaders and everything. But 61 was really, we asked like uh, Moscow like, too much, and Moscow like said, oh yeah, it's fine, you, you built that, it's mm -hmm. fine, we're happy about that. And on the other end, 89, it seems like, you know, Gorbachev, as you said, like was pretty like upset about this. So I was I was feeling like mm -hmm. it's a different time, different period, but there is something like where like with asymmetry, you can yeah, yeah, I, I think definitely nationalism was growing, uh, but uh, it was also like an issue um, for Mirab Kostava and uh, Zviadgam Sakurdia to orchestrate this protest and like seize the opportunity uh, from going uh, from multi-ethnic rivalry to, to like a separatist movement. Um, yeah, we can talk about it later. Okay. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. uh, before we wrap up this session, I just want to ask uh, if there is any further questions that may be uh, stuck in you and you would like to let it out, or because if not, then maybe people are just waiting to carry on this conversation in the framework of a lunch break. So in that case, thank you so much for this presentation.